All right. Hey, everyone. This is Bram Kanstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed, and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Samson Mao. He's the CEO of Gen3, a Bitcoin technology company focused on accelerating hyper-Bitcoinization. He's best known for his work with El Salvador's Bitcoin initiatives and his efforts in nation-state Bitcoin adoption around the world. As one of the top executives in the Bitcoin ecosystem, his expertise spans from running one of the largest exchanges and mining pools to guiding the development and deployment of Bitcoin infrastructure as the CSO of Blockstream. In the past weeks, he has also been talking a lot about the Bitcoin Omega candle, which I think we'll definitely talk about, and the road to Bitcoin being worth $1 million. Um, yeah, I'm super excited to talk to you, man. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Brom. It's good to be on. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been in touch on Twitter. It's uh, one of the things I really love about the Bitcoin space is that everyone is so approachable. You know, <laughs> it doesn't really matter on how long people have been in the space. Like uh, everyone is just really passionate about uh, about what this thing could be. So uh, yeah, it's just fun to um, to talk on Twitter. And now and now we're here. Um, we're going to talk about Gen Three, about the Omega candle that you tweeted about. But first, I wanted to ask you. How did you discover Bitcoin and what made you not get it initially? Let me think. Well, I guess the question is, what do you mean by discover? So I first saw Bitcoin just reading the news. I used to be a uh, very prolific reader of RSS feeds and um, ag news aggregators. So I would try to read all the news all the time. And I think, you know, in 2010, maybe I saw Bitcoin come up. And the narrative was Bitcoin's used by criminals and buying drugs and it's gambling money, etc. So I didn't pay too much attention to it. It just came up. But I think a, a few years later, I read an article about Bitcoin mining. And that was when I really went down the rabbit hole and started to, to understand the inner mechanisms of how Bitcoin works. Essentially, you look under the hood and there's nobody there. It's just people running ASICs and yeah. you know, GPUs and CPUs back in the day and mining it. So there's no control switch. Someone can turn it on and off. No one can modify the, the supply or anything. So that was when it really clicked for me. So was there was there a thing that made you like not get it or were you instantly hooked? Well, when I really dug into it, I think that was when I'm, I was really hooked. But before I really got into it, I it didn't click for me. It just sort of seemed like another fad or trend. Yeah, just like the easy dismissal that uh, a lot of people show, I'd say, right? Like it takes some yeah. time to find the thread, I'd say, that personally interests you, right? Like for you, it's mining. For me, it was uh, more like, uh, you know, the internet needs a currency, that angle. And other people really come at it from like the finance angle and stuff like that. So cool. If someone asks you, why is Bitcoin as a concept so big and important? What's your answer there? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we like to say as Bitcoiners that Bitcoin fixes this and it applies to a lot of things. Bitcoin fixes a lot of problems in society. It fixes inflation. It fixes the basement of currency. It fixes potentially even bad governance too. So that's why we say it. It's, a, it's like a Band-Aid saying. But the reality is Bitcoin fixes a lot of these things because a lot of things in the world are based off of our monetary system. In fact, you can look at human civilization as a whole is largely based on our ability to trade with one another and our ability to specialize. And that ability comes from having this concept or construct of money where we can trade and exchange our time and value with one another. So when that whole system becomes corrupted and it can be manipulated by central banks, governments, etc., then everything breaks down. And this is what we are seeing in the world today. And this is why Bitcoin fixes so many things. So I guess the answer is Bitcoin is important because it fixes a foundational part of civilization and society. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people also say, you know, like everything is downstream from how good the money is, right? I think that's also what, what you're saying here. Why... Why does it take so long for people to realize <laughs> that it's so broken? Yeah, <laughs> we would hope that it would be faster. But I, I think the problem is you're born into a fiat world 
and you're educated in a fiat designed educational system and you're inundated with fiat doctrine at all times and most people in general are very easily distracted too so uh, there's a new movie a new show and they just want to consume and watch that and in general i think people are just generally more prone to be consumers of things information entertainment products rather than producing creating and and all of this put together makes it very hard for people to understand that there are problems in the world and that things are breaking down because if you've never known the concept of hard money like you know if you were born in the in the 80s you know you were born into a world based off of a, a fiat money system that was not there was no gold backing at that point, right? Mm-hmm. And you grow up and you think that money is in the bank. That when you see a number on your bank statement, that is dollars. But it's not. It's actually just a fabrication. It's very hard to make that leap back to sound money. You have to go through a learning process and maybe a lot of pain um, dealing with things like inflation. And then you reach the conclusion that there is something wrong with the world. So it's sort of like can you wake yourself up from the matrix? Maybe, yeah. maybe you can, but it's also very hard because the matrix is all around you. Yeah. It's really that, right? Like I knew you were going to say matrix or else I would have said it, right? Like this is a matrix. Like the, the, the number you see on your screen is not real. Like it's like, it, it's, it's like the spoon is not there, right? There is no spoon. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's no money, but you're still seeing, you're still seeing the numbers and it's also very comfortable, right? To, well, that's also exactly like in the movie, right? To stay in the matrix, as long as you don't think like what is going on here, then you're safe and sound and, you know, with the attractions that we have. Um, yeah, you don't really have to think about it. Yeah. Fiat money is like a security blanket of sorts, you know? You can hold it and you think you're safe, but the reality is it doesn't protect you from anything. And in fact, it might harm you. But when you take away that security blanket, you're suddenly thrust into a world of having to take responsibility for things like yeah take responsibility of having custody of your own money and this is like an alien concept for people that grew up putting their money in the bank to keep it safe whereas you know in the 1900s maybe at least you would maybe keep your gold bars and <laughs> coins in a yeah. safe of your own so yeah. it's just an alien concept now that i need to take responsibility and i need to keep my own money for myself do you also experience that when you talk to people who are new to bitcoin this realization of uh responsibility like in in my like real life circle i have a few friends who've done really well and they don't have any bitcoin and one of the conversations i had was my friend said well if i have a million in bitcoin do i have to hold that myself i said yeah (laughs) that's the point but it was scary to him yeah I think uh, that definitely is a component of the discussions. Um, a lot of people just don't want to have custody. So I think yeah. like, as Bitcoiners, we're, we're kind of, uh, uh, we kind of feel a bit of disgust towards people that use custodians. But I, I think you might have to rely on that as a, a mid-step to getting people to self-custody just because <laughs> the concept of self-custody is so far removed from where they are right now. Maybe it's okay that they use a custodian or a custodial wallet because you know the shock yeah. to having your own money and being responsible for you know, thousands, tens of thousands, or even millions of dollars on your own shoulders is a big thing. Yeah, I think inducing the realization that no one is coming to save you, then I think that's kind of like the hardest thing, right? Like, who would voluntarily put that on themselves? Like, that's a bit crazy. Yeah, well, it it has a lot to do with governance as well. Like, but I think one of the problems we we ha- that we have with governance is people look to the government to save them. Like, oh, there's a virus, government save me, and then the government behaves almost like a very simplistic AI. Well, the simplest way to save you is to lock you in your house, right? Like, if I want to keep you safe from all harm, <laughs> I'll, I'll lock you in a jail cell, and then nobody will hurt you unless you're Epstein. But um, you know, the whole concept of the government saving you is sort of a misleading 
misleading train of thought that people take because uh, at the end of the day you have to protect yourself you have to do something yourself and even no. taking part in governance like well right now our system is largely democracies you have to vote you can't just hope that someone else will vote the right people in the power and that they will save you you actually need to do a lot of things in the world at least you should be yeah yeah i agree yeah i i personally find this like personal journey of people into bitcoin the most fascinating thing to talk about actually like uh i think most people can understand the bitcoin concept but actually integrating that uh as part of your world view where your whole world view is basically based on a matrix like illusion that's that's like the hardest challenge for people i think that that you can open your mind just enough to to see that other thing and then you know follow the rationale of the information that you then get yeah so how we'll get to that about uh you know when you talk to to leaders of nation how how that goes i'm super interested to hear but first gen three what's your mission and why did you start it so the mission of gen three is to accelerate hyper bitcoinization or the point at which we no longer need to go back to fiat monies and it's also helping onboard countries and getting them onto a Bitcoin standard. Because our theory is that we will end up on a Bitcoin standard, but there will be some chaos as we transition into that. So fiat monies have to be phased out, which means you might need parallel systems at some time, which is uh, a Bitcoin track alongside the fiat track so people can gradually move over. Because if it is a very sudden cataclysmic event, then a lot of people will simply be left out and will be scrambling to get into Bitcoin. So we're here to sort of usher in as well as ease that transition to Bitcoin. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is because I don't really see that many people out there doing what we do today, engaging with governments and trying to educate them and work with them. There are a lot of grassroots movements, but there is also an importance to focus on the top level adoption because the top level can make it very difficult for grassroots adoption if the laws and the regulations don't make any sense. And I think that is the value we bring. We can show the governments that this is a, a model for how you could adopt Bitcoin potentially, and you can implement some laws that will foster these grassroots communities and help them grow. And I think a good example of this is um, I saw on, on Twitter or X today, uh, Javier Millet from Argentina, the new president of Argentina, he went to the World Economic Forum. And I think he was commenting, you know, it's been corrupted by forces of socialism. And, you know, I need to go there and bring it back to reality. And it's it's a similar track to what we are doing. We are engaging with governments because your your choice is either to engage or not to engage. And if you don't engage, I think the problem can snowball and become worse than if you did engage. There's almost yeah. no downside to engaging with the government. I think we've had some people critique us and say, why are you helping governments get Bitcoin? The whole point is you separate money in state, et cetera, et cetera. But if we can get the government to adopt Bitcoin or champion the adoption of bitcoin yeah, then you that win also, of course <laughs> yeah that is the separation of money in states yes so, exactly yeah you know, you know there's a few ways to approach it you could hunker down and you know be anti-government and never want to engage and just you know do your own thing but the sad reality is the government could come after you someday just like in europe they're going after self-hosted wallets right if there had been more engagement more things like uh, bitcoin and bundestag in germany Maybe that wouldn't have happened because you can educate them and yeah. educating anybody, regardless of it's like some no coiner or uh, the government has really no downsides, right? The worst they'll do is say, no, I still hate Bitcoin, but they can't destroy Bitcoin. They could, the only, the, the only thing you, that might happen is they have less bad regulation, which in my view <laughs> is a good thing. Yeah. Well, but I think also because it's a it's a personal journey, like you're talking to a person, you're not talking to the entity, the government, you're talking to a person, right? Uh, actually, today I had a I had a discussion with a financial journalist in a Telegram group that I'm in, and uh, we talked about some opinion piece that someone wrote in like the Dutch Financial Times, and he's also a reporter there. 
And I said, you know, like the, the, the words in that piece were like pyramid scheme, a Ponzi, blah, blah. So I was like, this is, it's just so disingenuous. Like, I'm just disappointed at how disingenuous this is, right? And like, if you really understand this, you would not say this. And if you don't understand it, why do you pretend to say this, right? Like the stay humble thing. Mm-hmm. And then this guy replied like, yeah, but he's right. So what are you talking about? So then I got a bit into a quarrel with, with him. But then I was just thinking like, he and I looked him up, like he learned about Bitcoin. He's been looking at this for seven years, right? And so you have people that just dismiss it because they cannot, I don't know, fathom this whole ego <laughs> ego thing, basically, right? So maybe he's lost. But when you talk to someone, right, the fact that you you perfect you know, your pitch and your short explanation, et cetera, like you do put the information in their head, right? So if they are a um, honest person or an interested person or, you know, they, they can challenge themselves just enough, then perhaps that seed is already enough because you are talking to a person and not the, not the entity. Yeah, well, at the end of the day, governments are <laughs> made up of people, so you can still yeah. engage with them and talk to them. And you will have difficult people, but you will have people that are receptive to idea of bitcoin and learning a bit more too but when we engage with governments generally we try not to get into the nuts and bolts of it uh we don't talk too much about monetary theory and all the things that we just discussed right we focus more on aligning incentives to bitcoin as an asset and the the baseline of the pitch if you will is really energy is now money because of bitcoin and we did have a little bit of this in the past with oil, right? You have oil, you can put it into a barrel and export it and convert that latent energy into money. Now you can convert hydro, um, geothermal, any other form of energy that you couldn't put in a barrel now can be kind of put into this digital barrel as Bitcoin and sold. So we focus on getting them to understand that and seeing what they want because it's not about what we want. Of course, we want Bitcoin adoption, but If you want to convince someone to look at Bitcoin and understand it, you have to come at it from their interest. I mean, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is just a massive tangle of alignment of incentives between users, miners, businesses, and all sorts of people, right? We're all intertwined in these different alignments of incentives and interests. So we try to get them thinking, like, what do you need? Do you need to build an airport? Do you want... um, more energy production, you want hydro plants, you want geothermal plants, and then we see what we can do and propose ideas or projects that can be done to get them there using Bitcoin. And I think that's the most practical way to go about this. Yeah. Yeah, this was, uh, this was actually one of the things I wanted to ask, like, how do you pill an a orange pill, a country leader? Um, and I heard you say this, this, what you just said before, right? Like that the energy is your tr- translation you know, it's the power of your country in a, in a sense, right? Like if you are lucky that you have a lot of water or geothermal uh, activity or, or or whatnot, right? Like you can finally utilize that in um, yeah, a more global way than localized, um, you know, capturing that energy in a certain village or whatever, right? Um, is that then the main thing? The fact that they can enable more of their like natural resources if you can call it that uh it depends on what they're interested in um a lot of countries have excess energy and bitcoin can help them tap it you can use something like a bitcoin bond to raise capital to build those facilities to tap into that energy um maybe they have a goal of um, reducing emissions or reducing dependency on uh coal or something else and or or methane reduction so that way we pitch Bitcoin mining as a way to reduce flare gas, uh, which was what we did in Colombia uh, when we met yeah. with uh, President Petro. So it, it really depends on what they're interested in. Some people, some some uh, politicians are interested in uh, banking the unbanked or reducing inequity. And we say, well, Bitcoin can do that. You can just give someone a wallet, like the Aqua wallet, which is what we launched recently. And yeah. you know, they can onboard and access the financial system through Bitcoin without having to rely on banks to onboard people. So it, it really depends on what they're interested in. And I think that is our key focus. We don't go in there saying, you need to adopt Bitcoin because it's the future of the financial system. It fixes a lot of things and 
you know, yeah. be it money is broken. That's just the the wrong wrong way to go about it, and it's off putting to people. Like it's like yanking them out of the matrix by their, yeah. their shirt collar, right? It's yeah. better to go in and say like, "Well, what are the problems you're having in the matrix today?" And uh, <laughs> well, maybe uh, we can fix yeah. that with this thing yeah. over here. Fair point. Good point. So you just mentioned the Aqua Wallet. You you recently launched this last week or le- or two weeks ago, I believe. Um, can you share 3rd. a bit about that? Oh, of course, yes, January third. Yeah. Yeah, it's getting close to two weeks now. Um, so Aqua is a Bitcoin wallet and Layer Two wallet. So we have Bitcoin in there as well as um, Liquid and Lightning, and potentially down the road we'll have something like RGB. So the idea is that. It's a one-stop shop where you can do everything. Um, the core principle of Aqua is that it has to offer a lot of utility. So it cannot simply be a wallet for a wallet's sake. We need to allow people to swap into other things like stablecoins, like Tether USDT. Um, we have to have services where they can on and off board into the fiat system because the fiat system still exists today. So we, we have to offer the users a lot of utility, but we also want to be uh, pragmatic as Bitcoiners. So a lot of Bitcoin wallets don't integrate Tether, but Tether is issued on Liquid. So you don't need to integrate Tron or Ethereum or something like that. You can just integrate Liquid and then you get Tether. And Tether is the most dominant stablecoin in the market by far. I think they're at 70% dominance now. And if you go to Global South, which is our target market for Aqua, um, Latin America, you know, less developing countries, they all accept Tether. But the sad mm. thing is that they're using it on Tron and Ethereum. And we hope that by pushing Aqua, they'll start to use it on Liquid. And there will be benefits to them using it on Liquid as well, because Liquid has confidential transactions. So instead of everyone being able to see all your purchases, it's confidential. And you can unblind transactions as needed. But we'll, we'll have this deep integration with all these services that allow you to move your assets fluidly between main chain Bitcoin to layer two Bitcoin, which is lightning and liquid and to tether. And you can do that um, just using swap services. So we can be a non-custodial wallet and be a technology provider and simply integrate these services. So right now, the iOS version is a little bit gimped because Apple wouldn't let us have a swap button there. Um, so we're working through that, but the Android version, you can go from main chain Bitcoin to liquid to USDT. And then from the liquid wallet, you can send out on liquid or on lightning. So you can see, we can sort of access everything and the USDT channel, we can use swaps, uh, through side shift and go on to other chains as well. So if you're from Europe and you're traveling in LATAM, and you want to go to Argentina and you have to deal with people that want Tether to get to Argentinian pesos, well, you'll be able to go there with Aqua, swap to USDT and send it to them on Tron. And it's all in one interface. And sadly, we have to do that right now. But maybe in a couple of years, you'll just send them liquid Tether and you yeah. don't have to swap to Tron. But it's got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, I love how you are also taking feedback on Twitter. There's a lot of people who are trying this out. I think that's uh, that's great, right? Like you build you build in public, in essence. I think uh, you get a you get a lot of feedback from people, and uh, I think you also shared some updates about okay, uh, like this is already going to be in the next uh, in the next version, basically. So, but would you say that you know when you say like I'm a technology company, I'm focusing on nation state adoption, but also on on technology. Is this then also I think you just briefly mentioned it, but like part of this strategy, right? Like if a country decides, okay, uh, we work with you and, you know, let's say similar to El Salvador and, you know, wh- however they apply it in their country, then you also can provide them with technology that can help their citizens a- adopt using Bitcoin, right? Yeah. If they want to, we can set something up for them. Uh, we can also white label Aqua, like El Salvador has their Chivo wallet. Uh, but if another country wanted their own wallet for whatever reason, we can rebrand Aqua, white label it, and build an integration with them to their banking system so it would be a seamless experience for their end users. And it might be even better than Chivo because it would be non-custodial. The people would have their own yeah. wallet and they only need to interact with the banking system when they need to. So 
it's better for privacy and self custody, self sovereignty. Yeah, awesome. And so I saw you on lots of trips last year. You mentioned Colombia. I think you were in Mexico, Suriname lately. Uh, I heard you talk about the governor of Java, Indonesia, who uh, is uh, interested in Bitcoin. I think he is like the most popular person to be elected. Uh, I think, is that in February or not as president? It, but there's like elections in lots of these countries, it right? It changes. So the, the challenge of doing what we do at Gen3 in dealing with nation states is it changes on the other side. So <laughs> yeah. I, I think he was in the running. Uh, this is uh, Governor Ridwan Kamil. He stepped down from governor now. I think there's an interim governor. Um, but he was supposed to be the, running for VP. Now it's a, a different person running for VP. So things change all the time and we just have to adapt. So we'll, we'll see what happens with the next Indonesian election. But we do have connections there and we will be back. Yeah. And so um, I I talked... I don't know if it was with Philip actually, but in a previous episode also about Suriname, which is like a former colony of uh, the country that I, that I live in, and I thought it was really interesting that you that you went there because, well, I know some about Suriname, right? But there's there's so many like former colonies. Um, I think a few months ago we had uh, there were struggles in uh, Niger where France is a former colonist, right? And yeah, but then someone wrote a story to explain that in Niger they still use French francs that France pays Niger in French francs for the uranium yeah. a currency that France doesn't use anymore, you know? And so there's a lot of these, these, these formerly colonized countries that are still entangled, of course, with their former colonizers. And so I thought it was really interesting that you went to Suriname. I don't know what you can share about that, but I'd love to hear like what, what, what starts something like that, like a first visit to a country and well, for Suriname, like what, what is the angle there? Yeah, so Suriname was an interesting development. We we had that lead through Maya. Uh, she's a, a Bitcoiner from Suriname. And um, she started uh, engaging with us and making some connections. Uh, eventually, we met with the foreign minister uh, of Suriname, um, Albert Ramden. And we started having a series of meetings because he would go to uh, to Europe quite often. Um, and then Ben, our COO, Ben Van Hole, he would meet with him. And we also had a few online meetings with the central bank there to discuss uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin strategies. And then we arranged a trip there to meet with the president after a lot of legwork. So it just kind of happened gradually and organically. And hopefully now we'll be able to work with them on doing something with Bitcoin. But there's a, a there are a lot of opportunities there too, because they have uh, a lot of different interesting projects. They have uh, they've discovered oil off the coast, so there is yeah. the potential to do something like a, a a Bitcoin bond to raise capital for that. Uh, they have a lot of hydropower in the country as well. There is a hydro dam project that could potentially be done to mine Bitcoin with. There is excess energy at an existing hydro plant. There is a, a village deep in the Amazon that is looking towards mining Bitcoin to finance more energy infrastructure. Um, I'm probably missing something, but there's a lot of things that can be done there with Bitcoin. Uh, we also yeah. propose to the central bank that they can buy, uh, use their reserves to buy 1% of Bitcoin. And that's still underway. Hopefully they will do it soon rather than later, because I think Bitcoin price is going to go up. So we'll I talk about that. Can... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. I would hope yeah. that they do it sooner rather than later, but everyone gets Bitcoin at the price they deserve. So we'll yeah. See. Well, I think that's a nice leeway into the to the next question. I I sent out a tweet last week uh, with just like my global game theory prediction. I don't I'm not sure if you saw it, but I was thinking about um I think I saw something about like in Hong Kong they're thinking about ETFs. Apparently that's um expedited also. There's there seems to be some pace there as well. Yeah. Um and then I thought, well, if you can define BlackRock as a USG proxy and Hong Kong as as a as a China proxy, yeah, then could the Bitcoin ETFs in America be like a kickoff for for nation state adoption, right? Like, I mean, or, or at least a global game theory. Let's 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 stay there, right? Because I think, well, we're seeing that apparently this is happening in Hong Kong. So I wrote down, well, if America and China go, then I don't know what they're thinking about in uh, was it 
uh, Qatar or um, uh, I think the was Qatar was that the guy who visited uh, El Salvador or is that um, yeah, it's Qatar? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, it's Qatar. Um, and Oman has like a billion dollar uh, mining uh, experiment. I almost want to say with Marathon. Yeah, like these dominoes have to fall, right? Like it doesn't re- even if you're remotely thinking about adopting Bitcoin or maybe putting one percent on the central bank balance sheet. Like if your enemies or countries that you don't really like, if they go, like you, you have to go. Um, what what do you think about this? What's the, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I fully agree. All the dominoes are going <laughs> to fall, and I think that a lot of countries are still or countries, regulators, uh, financial authorities, etc. They all look towards the U.S. for guidance. So I think we did see, like, I've known that for a while that there is a spot ETF that's in discussions and getting close to approval in Hong Kong. This is from months ago, last year. Mm. Um, but we've seen other media post about it. I think Bitcoin Magazine posted to uh, a few weeks ago, and then they deleted it for some reason. I'm not sure why. And then um, recently, there is another a politician in Hong Kong saying that we need to accelerate this, but it is underway, and they are looking to the U.S. as a a, a, a rule setter or trend setter or the benchmark for whether there should or should not be a spot ETF. Um, yeah. Even there's a, uh, an ETF being filed in Australia uh, by Monochrome. I, I believe that the Australian regulator is also holding off on that, or we're holding off on that kind of waiting for the U.S. to make the move. So that will come, and that unlocks a lot of capital. And what you touched on earlier was a point I think I made as well, but in Hong Kong, well, Hong Kong doing something does mean that Bitcoin uh, is okay because Beijing okayed it. Yeah. Hong Kong would not do that if Beijing says no. And Hong Kong is sort of like the financial center if not for all of China, right? So all the mainland China money will flow to Hong Kong and access that ETF. Yeah. It's actually interesting. I think that not a lot of people still talk about the the banning of the mining in China and now it's allowed again and now we have ETFs coming, right? Like that is also in some form the cap- the capitulation, I think, that Bitcoin forces on the deniers, <laughs> I almost want to say, right? Like the incentives are the, just too strong, right? That, that That's, I, I think, a core of Bitcoin that you don't even have to really understand it, but when your incentives are aligned, like you have to go, right? I mean, uh, you now see, uh, I think Franklin Templeton, one of the ETF issuers, they still talk about crypto web 3.0, blah, blah, blah. Like they don't fully understand it, but they're still doing it, right? They're, they still join the race. So I think that's a fascinating aspect of, of Bitcoin there. And also in the ETF um, approval, actually, uh, it's it said commodity-based ETF, which I found interesting, right? So if you say, okay, commodity is basically captured energy in some sense, right? Like um, lots of commodities are used to refine and build something else. So it's captured energy. Well, if you see it like that and align that with what you just mentioned as your your pitch, yeah. then of course countries want to have this, right? Like it's a very short, in my mind, it's a very short loop. Yeah, the the approval of the ETFs is actually very big for a nation state adoption because uh, it signifies that Bitcoin is okay now. Right. When you can point like when we talk to some people, it still comes up, you know, Bitcoin is risky and it's not really uh, it's still something that criminals and hackers use, etc. Right. But now we can say, well, the largest asset manager on the planet has an ETF and along with 10 others. So it changes that discussion and it puts an end to that discussion immediately, which is very powerful in in the tool bag of things that we can use to orange till nations. Well, that FUD is gone, basically, right? Or at least... It'll remain, um, but you can squish for some the FUD. Yeah, you can yeah. squish the FUD very quickly. You know, yeah. like Bitcoin is used for money laundering. Well, then why is there an ETF for this money laundering thing? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah, fascinating. Probably it. this FUD was probably started by the people who are now running an ETF. But, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's, that's how it goes. All right. So ETFs launched. We this is the first day of the third day of trading. What's what's your twenty twenty four outlook? We'll talk about the Omega Candle. Maybe that is just the outlook. 
we can jump straight into that well, if you want. But uh, yeah. Personally, I think we're overdue for 1 million per Bitcoin in 2024, um, just based on the entire macroeconomic situation. So I guess my guess is 2024, 1 million. That's the outlook. All right. So you tweeted that, you know, a bit similar to what I just said, like ETFs would kick off perfect storm and you shared a list of things that would enable that. And I'd love to just, I just copy pasted your tweet and uh, I'd love to talk about, you know, these different uh, sure. elements. But first of all, the Bitcoin Omega candle, what is that? So the Omega candle is the next step after the God candle. So we've been talking about a God candle of uh, 10K green on the daily for some time now. An Omega candle is 100K green on the daily. So when Bitcoin goes up 100K or 0.1M. Yeah, I saw you define Bitcoin now in millions. I think that's actually pretty good. We should we should keep that. I think the unit bias in general is a really big thing in, in Bitcoin, right? Just for the ETFs, people buying uh, $25 or $45 ETF shares. Um, but yeah, some people and some organizations, some countries will only start paying attention at 1 million, probably. So um, yeah, I think that that's a great switch. Um, first thing on the list was the ETF ad campaigns. I'm personally really looking forward to the Super Bowl. Like, I'm just interested to see what they come up with. I mean, there was a Coinbase commercial, I, th I think it was last year or maybe even the year before. Um, so I am expecting multiple Bitcoin ETF um, ads. But yeah, wh why did you write down ETF ad campaigns? Well, I think this ties into uh, another tweet thread I did a couple of weeks ago. But uh, the premise is all of these ETFs are competing. They are competing for AUM, uh, and I don't think all of them are going to survive. It's going to come down to maybe three, four of them that are the dominant ones, and everything else is just, you know, no one cares. So they have to fight for market share and mind share. And the way that they do that is through advertising. And we've seen that already. So Bitwise has a pretty good ad out there with the uh, most interesting man. Um, yeah. I think, uh, who is the other one that did an ad? Vanek did an ad. I don't think Fidelity's done one yet. No. Um, it was the Black DeFi also guys. not really. It was the DeFi guy, uh, the DeFi ticker. Is that Hashtex? Yeah, not? Hashtex. They did one, but it was kind of floppy. Mm. You know, it was like crypto. And then they did another one. Yeah. It was mm, not that great. It was also Grace another one that was kind of too. like like a fiver thing i thought it was like a yeah, fiver grayscales was a fiver one that was basically i i, I commented fiver you, could quality. Replace, you could replace yeah. bitcoin with the word copper and the ad would work flawlessly yeah I agree. you know yeah we're the biggest copper etf yeah if you want copper yeah. Yeah. grayscale so yeah. yeah we know that they are doing ads and they are getting hollywood talent you know the bitwise ad is the best indicator of that so the question mm. is what is the next level and yeah next level super bowl with the uh, a-list star so we'll see what yeah. happens yeah probably i also saw in the video what's the is that galaxy with novogratz they had like a video of of mike novogratz talking and then he's sitting on a couch and he opens a paper and there it's like a full page ad you see on the paper of their etf so they're doing like all these classic things but yeah i uh i think the premise of we just need the biggest aum and therefore we do marketing yeah let's uh let's see let's see where we go yeah uh next point on the list was nation state adoption while well, we just talked about this um i don't know if you can share anything but why why you wrote that down for a reason is that i am assuming that's not a guess well we're working with a number of countries right so there's colombia Suriname, uh prospera not a country but a special economic zone uh madeira and uh, Montenegro, there's a lot of countries that we are engaged with, and you know there are more that we haven't talked about yet. Those are in the redacted column. But okay. There's a lot of work to be done, and I think as Bitcoin price goes up, as the ETFs solidify, and as these ETFs make their ad campaigns, it makes it a lot easier for us to engage about Bitcoin. Like when Bitcoin price tanked after FTX and Do Kwan, that was a very difficult time. But even before we recovered to these levels, we started to get some re-engagement again. Mm. And that's why we had those meetings towards the end of uh, 2023. But if Bitcoin does go to uh, 
0.1M or higher, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more countries coming and trying to engage and figure out what to do. Yeah. Just a new question I got based on based on this, like when you talk to people in countries, you talk about, you know, what's how can they utilize, you know, their resources and then you connect it with Bitcoin. But when we talk about, you know, game theory and the global adoption, there's also the rush comes from or the speed comes from the scarcity, right? Like, do you ever use that argument? I mean, that that's what I think in this global game theory. Like, even if you're remotely thinking or you're still in discussions, like at one point you have to you have to go like what the safe dean says about the gunpowder, right? Like you can fade the gunpowder, but then you die. Do you see that yeah. as the same thing? Like eventually they're gone, I'd say. Yeah, we actually, I'm just trying to think. No, we, we haven't, when we talk to the presidents, we don't talk about scarcity. I think oh. that's <laughs> not necessary. Just focus on the uh, monetary yeah. aspect of it and the ability to change yeah. things in the near term. Yeah, because once you go into scarcity, you go into a monetary theory, and that's like another can of worms. And you have to understand that when we get to the meetings with the presidents, it's not like we get you know five hours over yep. <laughs> yeah. days, no, like five hours today, five hours tomorrow. We get yeah. like an hour and maybe more, maybe maybe an hour and a half, maybe two, but it's not unlimited time. So we have no, to be no, very concise yeah. and go in with a very compact argument. We can't wax, you know, theoretical and you know, Bitcoin yeah. could send us to Mars one day. I mean, that's what killed Dave Portnoy, right? <laughs> I don't, when the Winklevoss, I don't, yeah. when the Winklevoss yeah. twins were telling him, uh, you know, gold can be mined on asteroids. Elon's going to mine the gold and bring it back. That just blew his mind to pieces and he never recovered. <laughs> no, okay. Well, I don't, I don't think I was that far, but it's more like in my mind, it's kind of like the second thing because one, if you understand that Bitcoin is digitized energy and you can use that, the leverage that you have to turn physical energy as a country into digital energy in a commodity and then trade it across the world. Yeah, you can do that, but there's also that scarcity part in it. So yeah, it's just where my my mind went, but uh, we'll, we'll see. I scarcity, think it's just, uh, yeah. The scarcity will man manifest itself in the price of that asset that you're trading. That, that is true. That you're trading. Yeah, that's the so, proxy for it. Yeah, I agree. It, yeah, it's it's a simpler way to not go there, but yeah, talk about price appreciation. We talk yeah. about projections, like you know, our our estimate is sixty percent annualized uh, growth per year. So in ten years, you know, three plus million dollars. That's very conservative. Yeah. So we we focus on that. Like the scarcity manifests itself in price, so it, it's gotcha. covered. All right. Next point, the halving. They're having. Well, that's self-explanatory. Supply gets cut. <laughs> yeah. Well, I saw interesting calculations uh, people doing on Twitter if uh, uh, they were talking about like if there's a constant stream into or well, uh, out of Coinbase or well, out of uh, holder pockets or wherever they get the Bitcoin from into Coinbase for the ETFs, then um, that's already like BlackRock bought like 14 days of new daily supply or something. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of the argument behind that or the reasoning, right? Like uh, if it gets cut in half and the um, the buying keeps this, uh, stays the same for the ETF or even grows, then of course that has an effect on uh, on the price. All right. Yeah. The next. I think yeah. I posted a picture too that uh, someone made. I forgot who I. I just pressed repost picture and it didn't tag the guy and I lost it. But uh, mm. it was a calculation of how much exchange Bitcoin remains, one point four million or so. Uh, and how long it takes to exhaust that just by current ETF demand. And it was like something to the order of 80-ish days, which kind of lines up with having. So yeah. at the time, in theory, all the exchange Bitcoin is hoovered up. You have the having, which cuts supply down more. So it's very interesting to look at this, these numbers. Yeah, I think to give him credit, I think it was Luke Mikic, like the Australian okay. guy. Because I talked with him on another chat and he said the same thing, like in 80 days, this is gone. And I was like, what, really? And then he, yeah. I think he said the same, the same picture, yeah. All right, next point, the Veblen effect, which basically says, it's funny because I tweeted before, I think the higher the price, the less sellers because you know it, it's legitimized, right? So then you know what you have, so less people will sell. Is this similar? Because I think Veblen effect is the higher price, the more attractive, 
means legitimization, higher hold rate, yeah. higher price, etc. I think it's coined for luxury goods. So the more yeah. expensive a luxury good is, the more people value it because it's a status symbol and it costs a lot. And that's what makes it luxurious. And yeah. I think Bitcoin, we've already proved that the Velen effect works on Bitcoin. <laughs> but unfortunately, it was proved when we went down. So when we went down, <laughs> no one wanted to buy it. 15K, it's a horrible thing. Nobody wants that, that, that garbage Bitcoin, right? Because it it's 15K. But that proves that the effect will work when it goes up. When we go to 0.1M or 0.5M, that's when Bitcoin is a very, very attractive thing. It's also mm -hmm. tied in psychologically to the market cap of gold. Because at 0.25M or 0.5M, we eclipse gold market cap. And yeah. that's when Bitcoin is the new gold. And that's when yeah. the ETFs run their new campaign. Like this is the new goal, and uh, that's basically anchors Bitcoin. And yeah, people will just I, want Bitcoin I think that, more. Yeah, I think that will shatter world views, right? Like, uh, oh, and by the way, if, well, one Bitcoin is already one Hermes Birkin bag, right? Like, I think that bag is like forty k. So I think we're there in terms of yeah. luxury goods, at least price level. But yeah, when we were around like sixty five k, I think we crossed. We um, like Bitcoin was more valuable than silver, right? Mm -hmm. And so most people, most adults, they grew up with gold and silver is the thing you need to have, right? But then you would have been forced to say like gold, Bitcoin, and then silver is what you uh, need to have. So yeah, I find that very interesting too. Like that narrative will change because then, yeah, it, you ha you cannot ignore saying Bitcoin, right? Because then it, yeah. it is just provably, <laughs> you know, worth more. Yeah, fascinating. All right. Um, the 118 multiplier. This comes from uh, Bank of America report from uh, I think the height of the last bull market where they said one one dollar in means uh, 118 dollars uh, uh, added to the market cap yeah do you think that still holds like have you did you dive into that more I haven't gone into it more but I've seen people say yeah it's too high it should be you know maybe two to ten three but yeah. it, it, like to recap for people it's one dollar going into Bitcoin increases market cap by X. So I think they probably work backwards. And I, I remember reading the report. I, I'm pretty sure they work backwards from some increase. And they said one dollar in because they were measuring inflows increased market cap by 118 times. So it's not like it's a theory or a projection. It's a reverse calculation. And yeah, that means that it could be much higher. And the multiplier effect can be amplified by the Veblen effect, right? So at 500K, or sorry, 0.5M per Bitcoin, <laughs> I think a dollar there would have a far bigger impact than lower because it makes that luxury good even more luxurious and even higher in demand. So we'll, we'll see what yes. happens. But it's a combination of all these factors. I mean, jumping ahead to supply and demand shock, how yeah. does supply demand shock, Veblen effect, and multiplier interact with one another. Because there is an interaction there. These things don't yes. just work on their own. They all amplify one another. And this is why I made the 1M prediction, because nobody really knows what happens. This is the, the Bitcoin ETF is the first, the first ETF time. Yeah. of a, a good with limited supply. You, know? mm -hmm. you have corn ETFs, gold, copper, you don't know the supply. It always goes up. Gold is what, 2% a year uh, supply increase, something like that. But everything in the past was not bound. So there's always more. But, yeah. you know, Bitcoin is different. So yeah, I, we'll, I we'll agree. see what happens. I agree. I, I like the... Um the predictions and and i think it's good you say like nobody really knows but i do think and i agree you know but i do think you can pinpoint to some of these things and say like this could get really weird like really weird right because yeah what you mentioned the the multiplier at least it's proven up to a certain point i think we saw something similar with the fake etf tweet right mm -hmm. where i think like 500 million max came in in 30 minutes and it moved the market cap by 50 billion so that that was a that was 100 um yeah. i think we've already seen in the last week something uh, because 
the price went up before the grayscale sell-off started. So there you already saw it a bit. And I agree, if the higher the price, the less sellers. Yeah, this is going to go up one way or another. And that's going to cause, that's the next point, max pain. I like the max pain theory. Is that just, you know, you think you're going to go this way, but it's probably going to go the other way? Or like, how would you explain the max pain theory? Well, the max pain theory is, in essence, is um, <laughs> it's like a, the most painful outcome, or Elon Musk puts it, the most interesting outcome is the most likely outcome. Entertaining, but, yeah. Yeah, uh, entertaining. <laughs> so the yeah. most painful outcome, at the end of the day, like I made a list of max pain points, um, mm. but the, the most serious one, some of them were jokes. Like I said, Plan B's uh, stock to flow is going to break again, but up this time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the real max pain is that 8 billion people on this planet will not get a chance to enter Bitcoin in a way that would impact their financial lives in a meaningful way. So yeah. we know that there is a divide. There, There's the Kentillon effect and Kentillionaires. And the thinking is, well, the best case thinking is everyone can get into Bitcoin. Your, your average Joe in, you know, in a working job can accumulate some Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin goes to a million, it'll even out the system. So, or, or, or some guy in Latin America can accumulate some Bitcoin because typically they're earning pesos or something and they're not able to keep up with doll the dollar even. Let's not talk about Bitcoin. But the ideal case is that Bitcoin can unify and even up the playing field because we all have a little bit of Bitcoin and then Bitcoin goes up to a million. We are you know, balanced out with the, the people that have control of fiat money. So the worst yeah. case scenario is that doesn't happen. They just inject a ton of capital, convert their fiat into Bitcoin and beat everyone else. They front run 8 billion people and it's status quo. The the billionaires that control the world still control the world, but now they have Bitcoin and everyone else is still, you know, trying to get by with a few sats. Yeah. Well, that's why we have to talk more about Bitcoin, right? More, more podcasts, more, more education. All right. Last two points. And I think this is also what uh, Michael Saylor mentioned um, when he said, well, what legitimizes a 5 million Bitcoin price? He said ETFs approved. Uh, fast B rules is one of the things you mentioned, right? Like those are the accounting rules. So companies yep. can uh, report the fair value of the Bitcoin. So yep. that's a more equal reporting in that sense. And I think his third one was um, like banks offering uh, financial services. Well, maybe that's to the extension also of the ETFs. And your last point was renewed QE. And I think today we saw some news about that where... Um, the Fed is thinking about pivoting. Like, what, what can you share about that? Well, <laughs> they have no choice but to pivot, right? <laughs> uh, the funny thing is that the Bitcoin halving cycle lines up nicely with the election cycle in the US. So, you know, the it goes back to the, a lot of problems with governance, but we can go into that another time. But, you know, the new administration, when they start, they can do things. But when it's time for election, they need to give free stuff to people again, right? Yes. They need to they need to get the people happy and get the vote, right? And they will sacrifice the future for that. So that means renewed QE. It has to happen. Also, the debt is ballooning, right? The interest payments to service the debt in the US are getting to hundreds of billions of dollars. And they just went up from thirty four to thirty five trillion in debt. And if you know how compound interest works, that you know that that is going to spiral out of control because it compounds, right? It's like, it's exponential. Compound interest yeah. is exponential. So they can keep that up and get more debt or they can lower interest and print money to service the debt because that's the only way to deal with that. They have to print money from somewhere because it's not going to come from GDP. There's just too much that has been sprinted, uh, printed and spent already. So QE is yeah. inevitable as we go into QT, quantitative tightening, or quantitative, sorry, quantitative hardening, Q, QH for Bitcoin. QH. <laughs> I didn't hear about that before, but yeah, we'll see. Okay, well, and what's your timeline? We said 2024, but of course, like what, uh, love for you to name a month <laughs> or date. 
Well, I did say uh, we can get to 1 million, 1M BTC in days to weeks after the ETFs are launched. So I did put a hard cap on that. I said seven weeks because eight would be getting into months territory. So we'll see what happens. Okay. But okay. these predictions are for fun. And I think some people are angry about the predictions because they don't understand yet that you can't really predict what Bitcoin does. Bitcoin will always yeah. do its own thing. And a lot of us that are having fun throwing these numbers out, we already understand that. And we know that. But I think the disconnect is that some people think you can predict it, that you can do TA and you can anal analyze where it's going to go. And that we are irresponsible for saying things like 1 million or 1.5 or 2. <laughs> Whereas we just see that you can't guess any of it. And we're just guessing for fun. But the end state is really, there is no more fiat. You can't price Bitcoin in dollars anymore. So all of this is just for entertainment. Yeah. Well, I agree. I think it's more like a point where we are going because, you know, although we cannot put a price on it or an exact timeline, you can talk through a longer through all of these things that we just talked about or in general, you know, why is Bitcoin better than any fiat based system, right? And I think that's also kind of the acceptance in Bitcoin where you know this is a better thing and and we all do a, a different job of evangelizing that and sharing that with people or educating people and we know it's true so you know this eventually will happen not because we are not doing anything but exactly because we are doing stuff right and so yeah that's why i think it's also fun it's kind of it's just we're we're thinking through it and it would just be really entertaining if we hit one million right like that's i said this before on this podcast like uh, when i went more into bitcoin was after I read a tweet of someone who said, well, if you think Bitcoin is an experiment that's going to zero or everything, if you even remotely think it's going to be everything, you have to have a seat in the stadium. And then mm -hmm. that's when I thought, well, I need to get, you know, solidify my seat in the stadium. And the 1 million Bitcoin is like one of those moments while you're sitting in the stadium or a nation state adoption, right? Or the ETF approval, same thing. Like it's all these little steps where... Yeah, you can enjoy along the way and and secretly also maybe a little bit think like I'm right, you know, like I understand this thing and I'm enjoying what's happening. Yeah. So uh yeah, I agree. Fun. Awesome. Well, last question that I ask everyone um is what is a core belief that you will never let go? Hmm. That's a good one. I don't think I've been asked that before. What what is your core belief? Uh, that's tricky. That's a politician uh, reply, man. Like, what is your... <laughs> well, you, you tell um, me yours, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I think uh, this is a good question. It's funny because I asked this question uh, well more than 20 times now, but I, my core belief is I actually have a tattoo. My, I have a tattoo that says never slow down, never grow old. Like, I think the whole purpose of humans is to evolve and move forward. So, it's a fun and interesting life pursuit if you keep following what's happening with humanity. And I think that has always been like my personal, um, how to say, like, like, yeah, like a personal core thing to, to always just be interested in like, what are people doing? Right. And if you dismiss, Hey, that sounds like a stupid idea or that will never work, then you're probably wrong because they are spending their time. The most precious thing we all have on something and if you easily dismiss it, then you probably don't see something. So I, I'm always interested in in growing. I think learning is growing, failing is growing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's a good one. I, I believe that too. So I would say my core belief is that people are fundamentally good and they can be corrupted and there are bad people. But at the start, everyone is good. And that's how we should try to engage with people. That you know, they may be wrong on some stuff, but they are fundamentally good, or they were taught the wrong things, or they've done wrong things, but fundamentally they are good. And generally, I think people want what's best for the world, even if they don't always do it or manifest it. I agree. Well, let's hope that um, we can share that message more often. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks for talking. And uh, yeah, of course, I will link to your social profiles, Gentry, Aqua, and then people can follow your journey with Gentry. So uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on. It was a real pleasure.
Yeah, thanks, Brom. It's fun. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening.